Um, I just want to reiterate what Pastor uh, Mark and Nina were saying. I don't come to your church. I'm not a, a member of your church, but I really encourage you to get behind uh, that vision for provision for vision or whatever mission or whatever it's called, something, vision for provision. And uh, because we, uh, you know, why are you laughing at me? That, like, just because I don't pay attention in church? You guys don't pay attention in church either. I know that. So, but... Uh, I, I, I encourage you, I'm, I'm from Prison Fellowship, by the way, this morning, that's why I'm here today. Um, Pastor Nikki and uh, Pastor Mark met, met with me earlier in the year and, and uh, you know, just allowed me to come in and, and uh, experiment on you Redcliffe guys uh, today, so just hopefully you get something good out of this. But um, Prison Fellowship, every year, I just want to thank you as a church, because out of that missions offering that you give, that free will offering that you give, Literally uh, hundreds of families are touched around Queensland through our Angel Tree program, which you guys participate with at, at, at towards the end of the year. And so uh, families are prisoners, and I just want to thank you for what you, what you do, for your giving, and I encourage you to keep giving. You know, I'm very selfish today. I want you guys to keep giving so that more people can be ministered to and blessed through, through what we do as well. So just want to thank you guys for doing that. Um, as I mentioned, I'm from Prison Fellowship, but... Uh, uh, my background is in pastoral ministry. I'm an ACC pastor, um, and pastored in churches in Western Australia, um, Thailand, um, where else? Launceston in Tasmania and here in Brisbane as well. And uh, just this year, I started in prison ministry uh, um, with Prison Fellowship. I'm married. I've been married for 30 years, celebrated my 30th anniversary beginning of last month. 4th of July, can you believe it? Independence Day, isn't that a little ironic? As uh, some lady sung about one time many years back, probably when, probably about 30 years ago, actually, when I think about it. But uh, yeah, been married for 30 years, got four children, two adult sons who are in Bible college. In, in the, we have a Bible college in our church, and uh, um, they're 21 and 20 and single. So I've got photos afterwards for you single ladies out there. And, uh, and then I've got my two daughters, 17 and 15, they're in high school still. And you can't have their photos, sorry. Um, <laughs> And uh, you won't be getting any of those photos until about 10 years from now. It's all good. You know, I don't know why that is, but it just is, okay? I'm, as a dad, it just is. Um, yeah, so anyway, I should talk about prison ministry, shouldn't I? I should talk about what I've come here. I'm actually not going to talk about too much about it, but just, uh, you know, when I, when I first started in prison fellowship, I hadn't really thought about it before, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the Bible happens around prison. You know, when you think about Joseph and everything that happened to him, it started with him becoming a prisoner. First of all, for, to some slave traders. Well, his brothers did it to him, first of all. But then to some slave traders, then he's working for a guy. The guy doesn't, you know, he gets falsely accused, wrongfully accused. They should make a movie about it. And then he gets, from the 90s, they should, that's the kind of names they came out with movies in the 90s. But then he, he gets uh, wrongfully accused, he goes to prison, and, uh, and then that's the, the place where he gets elevated from, from prison. You know, I think about Daniel and his three buddies, you know. They started off life as prisoners, but yet were able to elevate in, in an ungodly, anti-God uh, worldview and system, and yet still be able to do what God wanted them to, to do and, and succeed. Uh, I think about um, old mate Samson. Um, you know, he had his most successful part of his ministry was when he was a prisoner. John the Baptist, prisoner. Jesus, prisoner. Peter, prisoner. John, prisoner. Apostle Paul, repeat offender. <laughs> he was in jail all the time. Half the, half the New Testament got written from jail. Can you believe that? She. Paul and Silas. I'm going to talk about them today, I reckon. Let's talk about Paul and Silas today. Um, you, know, Paul, you know, Paul and Silas, here they are, minding their own business, trying to do what God wanted them to do. You guys know the story, don't you? you know, I, can, I, I look across this crowd, I see some, some, uh, some people who look like they know stuff. And uh, Apostle Paul and Silas, they're there, um, they're actually in Turkey, modern day Turkey, and they're, they're, they're ministering, and then they've got this bit of a team going on. There's a few other guys hanging out with them. And then 
you know, they're praying about, okay, where do we go next? And so they, they want to go over here. Oh, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Well, what about over here, God? Yeah, no, not over there. Then one day Paul gets this vision of this Macedonian man. I don't know what a Macedonian man looks like, but he got this vision of a Macedonian man, must have dressed very distinctively. And uh, he sees this Macedonian guy and he's yelling at him, come over here, come and help us, we need your help. And so Paul goes back to the team and he says, hey guys, I've had this vision, I reckon it's from God, I reckon God's given us a clue that we need to leave here and we need to go across to the other side of the Aegean, to, to Europe, and let's start the ministry in Europe. We've been doing some good stuff here in Asia and now it's time to go across to Europe and let's do some good stuff over there. And God is going to be with us and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome because God showed me in a vision that they need our help. They, they're crying out for it. They need us. So this is going to be awesome. So they jump in the boat. They go across to Macedonia, they start out in this place, Philippi, and they're, they're preaching there and, you know, and, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's okay. Then they go down by the riverside, start singing a song, and they start meet, they meet some people down by the riverside, and then there's, you know, there's, there's a bit of fruitfulness there. Some people come to Christ, and so, you know, some people's families start to get saved, so they're starting to get a bit of traction, a bit of momentum. Then as they're cruising through Philippi, there happens to be a, a, a young woman who is, you know, she's, she's in slavery. This slavery was a big thing back in those days. And I'm not saying it's right, just, it was just a thing. And so this lady's in slavery and, and uh, she's, she's possessed by multiple demons. But these demons are helping her to be able to tell people's fortunes. And so the owners are making huge coin off of this girl's ability to tell people's futures and to tell their fortunes. And so this girl, that something inside of her, this recognises what's going on inside of, of Paul and Silas and the team. And so she starts following them around, saying, listen to these guys. These guys are the servants of the Most High God. You need to listen to what they have to say. Now, if that was me, I'd be like, oh, man, confirmation. Come on. I'm in the right place. Even the demons are crying out and recognising that I've got something good to say. This is awesome. So it's awesome for about the first five minutes. But this keeps happening day after day after day after day. And so Paul and just finally he's had a gutful. He says, I can't stand this anymore. So he turns around. You guys know the story. He says, get out of her in the name of Jesus, you filthy mongrel demon. And the demon comes out. And you would think, everybody would be like, yay, awesome, you know, deliverance, it's brilliant, it's amazing. But instead, the owners get angry because they can see that their meal ticket is now no more. So they grab these guys with a crowd, they take them in front of the magistrates, the leaders of the city, and they say, these guys are telling us to do things that it's illegal to do. And so the magistrates go, well, okay, if you say so. Don't seem like much good magistrates to me, but anyway. So they end up getting these guys beaten up and then thrown into jail. You guys know that story. Isn't that how it happens sometimes in life? You think you're doing what God called you to do. You think you heard something from God. You believe that God spoke to you in your heart or through somebody else or through what you were reading. And so you step out in faith believing that it's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be incredible. But instead, it never quite turns out the way that you thought it was going to turn out. And I can just imagine Paul and Silas, we had a vision. You told us to come here, God. We thought that when we came, that people would just bow down as we carried the anointing of the Holy Spirit on our lives, that as we entered the city, that people would just fall down, weeping, crying out, what must I do to be saved? But yet instead, we had a bit of momentum, we had a bit of success, and then we did the right thing. We cast a demon out of, a, out of somebody, and now for our trouble... Doing what you told us to do, God, we've been beaten up and now we're in jail. Why? 
you never behave like that. I know you don't. But sometimes I do. Sometimes when I step out in faith and believe God for something and I do what I feel like God said, it doesn't happen the same way that I thought it was going to go in my head. I, I reach out to someone and say, hey, mate, God loves you. They tell me to off. I'm like, oh, I, just, I was doing what God told me to do. You guys don't do that, but I do that. But here, let's read what happens in Acts chapter 16, verses 25 to 34. Because Paul and Silas didn't do what I would have imagined that I would do in their situation. It says this, they're in jail, right? Verse 25, I'm reading from the NIV today. Don't judge me, it's in the Bible. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Got nothing else to do. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped and that was his responsibility and that's what you did in those situations because otherwise somebody else would do it to you. So he thought, may as well do it myself. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Hello. There it is. Verse 31. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your house. If you're not a Christian here today, you came in here, but you were seeking. That's all you have to do. It's pretty simple. Just believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, verse 32, and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Amen. How awesome is that? i got some thoughts for you today about Paul and Silas and what they went through. See, I believe you matter. The title of my message is, I think, I think it was up there before, but I said, you matter. You and I, we matter. We're, just not, we're not just nobodies, we matter. First of all, this, th- this thought came to me in verse, verse uh, first point. You matter because your praise changes atmospheres. Hello? Your praise changes atmospheres. Your declaration that comes out of your mouth changes situations and circumstances see apostle paul and silas they could have sat there like i probably would have and had a big cry about the whole thing and felt sorry for themselves but they made a conscious decision i believe it wasn't just something that they were naturally sunny people because you read some of the writings of the apostle paul he's not a naturally sunny person he's quite a severe dude But in this moment, he makes a decision between him and Silas that they're going to start singing. They're going to start declaring the word of God over their situation. You know, so I can imagine them just, you know, Paul and Silas, you know, like just, you know, sitting there in prison. It's going, man, this sucks. That rat has run over my foot for the 20th time and this is bad. But you know what? There's one name that holds every victory. There's one voice that silences the enemy. There's one king who reigns for all eternity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on, sing it again. One name. Wow. Wow. Probably started too low, didn't I? That's my fault. One voice. Come on, louder, Silas. Come on, man. Put put some effort into it. One king who reigns for all eternity. Jesus, 
Jesus. Yeah, let's do it another time. Do it another time. Do it another time. Sing it again. And as they do it, something begins to happen. Something begins to shake. All of a sudden, there's something that begins to change in the atmosphere and the circumstances around them. The chains come off. The walls come, you know, start to shake. Then they start to see, my chains are gone. I've been set free. They're excited. See, this is what happens. They start to open up their mouth and miracles start breaking out. See, praise can break chains. No deliverance ministry necessary. They self-delivered. They make prophetic declarations over their circumstances and things begin to shift in the atmosphere and things begin to change around about them. You and I can do that too. You know, pretty much every song that we sung today had some sort of declaration over our life made some sort of declaration about the greatness of our God and about the fact that we have the King of Kings living on the inside of us and and we could speak something out and make things happen. When I lift my voice and shout, walls come crashing down. We've got that power. Your praise changes atmospheres. Number two, your breakthrough helps others. See, it wasn't just Paul and Silas's chains that came off in that moment. It was everybody's chains came off at exactly the same time. See, I believe that when we receive a breakthrough, when we go to God and, and you know, we, we, we might be struggling in an area or might see something uh, that, that's holding us back and then in a moment we, we start to, to press into God and we say, okay, God, I receive your grace in this area of my life. As we do that, as we receive our breakthrough, it's not just for us. When you're believing God for a healing in your life and you receive that healing in your body, it's not just for you to go, yay, woohoo, now I can, you know, go play golf again or whatever it might be. It's actually so that you've got a testimony so that when somebody else comes to you with that same issue and problem in their life, that you can say, well, look, I don't, don't, you know, God doesn't respect people. I'm nobody special. He healed me. I think he could heal you too. Do you want me to pray for you? When you receive a breakthrough, it's not just about you, it's for others. On the other side of your freedom is the freedom for others as you are able to help them from a new platform. You know, I think about my friend Ben. Sorry, I'm spitting on this thing. That was annoying me. I was like looking at this, making me go cross-eyed. A bit of spit on the microphone. Don't you love that? You don't love that, particularly in these COVID times. They're going to super sanitise this thing after I'm finished. You know, you know they are. But I, I have a friend named Ben. My friend Ben, he's an awesome guy, but he wasn't always an awesome guy. My friend Ben was a drug addict and an alcoholic, and he came from a family of drug addicts and alcoholics, and uh, he was a pretty violent, rough kind of guy, and he had you know, a whole bunch of kids. He had four kids, four young children. And, uh, and he had a partner, his, his wife, I think they were married. I don't even really know. I'll probably ask him later on. But he you know, but had, had, had somebody in his life, the mother of his children, and they, she left him. She, you know, she said, you, 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 you're a mongrel. I don't want to be around you. You're violent. You're all these things. And, and, uh, and I don't feel safe around you. And she left him and she left the kids with him. So Ben's here on his own. With four kids, he was never violent towards his children. He's just a rough guy. So Ben's here on his own with his four kids. And he's a drug addict and he's an alcoholic. And he's on his own. And life wasn't looking too great for him. But what happened? He had a neighbour who was like this, I don't want to say nerdy, but he was a nerdy Christian guy who who lived next to Ben and was kind of a bit intimidated by Ben and a bit scared to kind of interact with Ben because Ben was a rough bloke. And, uh, but he just felt like God was saying, no, you've got to love this guy. 
And so my, this little nerdy Christian guy who I've met subsequently, he, every now and then he just, you know, reach out over the fence and say, hey, Ben, you know, like, do you want me to take the kids to school for you this week sometime so you can just, you know, you don't have to stress about that. Ben say, oh, cheers, mate, thanks for that. I say, oh, good, good, good. Then he, he'd, every now and then he'd reach out over the fence and say, hey, Ben, do you, want, do you want to come to church with me this week? I reckon, you know, I reckon, you know, you'd really like it. And Ben would say stuff that you, you know, I've heard people say this, right? Ben would say, oh, mate, nah, I couldn't go to church. And he'd say a few extra words in there. He'd say, if I went to church, you know, the, 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 the walls would come down, lightning would strike it, and, you know, it would be terrible. You don't want me to come to church, mate. And uh, you've heard people say stuff like that. But this Christian guy would be like, ooh, okay, yeah, settle down. And he kept at it. He kept persisting. Every couple of months, he'd invite Ben to come to church. And one day, for some reason that Ben doesn't even know why he did this, but when this friend, this neighbor invited him to church one time, he said, yes. I said, Ben, come to church. And he stepped in. And the presence of God just hit him in that place. The walls didn't come tumbling down. But the walls in his heart came tumbling down. And Ben committed his life to Jesus. But he was still a drug addict and an alcoholic. You know, that sometimes happens. Not everybody gets delivered straight away. But over the course of the next couple of years, Ben's life began to turn around. He went to a program um, in our city for people who were struggling with addiction. And he got set free, completely set free. His, restora- his, his, his life, his, his relationship with his children was, had been tough and strained, but that got restored and his kids started to come into life at church and, and their lives began to be transformed as well. But it didn't stop there because, you know, Ben met a new lady and uh, they got married and they've got another child in their life as well. So now he's got five kids. He's beaten me by one. I'm, it's not a race because I'm not going there. But he, his life at Trezor, but it didn't stop there because Ben now works in that same ministry that helped him get free. Now he works in that same ministry and he's literally seen hundreds of Young people's lives transformed by the power of God's love and by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, it wasn't just about Ben. It was about others as well. And it all started with a nerdy Christian neighbor. So if you're a nerd in here, own it. God uses nerds. Who knew? Well, I knew because I'm a nerd too. Point number three. Sometimes you have to choose between fruitful and freedom. See, when Paul and Silas started praising and their chains came off, if I was in their shoes, I would have legged it. I would have been out of there. I would have been like, yoo-hoo, I'm free. The chains have come off and I'm bolting out the door before somebody finds out. But not Paul and Silas. They knew that God was up to something more than just taking their chains off. There was something about to happen. And as they heard this man unsheath his sword and begin to, you know, to, to try and kill himself, Paul makes a decision in that moment. He could have kept his mouth shut and gone and gone free and been out the door. But he made a decision to choose fruitfulness over freedom in that moment. That man's life was more important than his personal freedom. You know, I'm representing Prison Fellowship here this morning. And uh, Prison Fellowship was founded by a guy named Chuck Colson. And looking around this room, I'm not going to make any... uh, uh, point any fingers here but uh, there's a few vintage people out there today <laughs> if you're vintage you got to own it because vintage means valuable these days doesn't it all the young people want to wear vintage clothing 
And all the, all the vintage people want to drive vintage cars because they're the only ones who can afford them. Oh, I love a 1963 Ford Thunderbird convertible. So if you've got one and you feel like you want to bless me with it, come see me after the service. Or an old Mustang or an old Monaro, that would be good too. So just saying, just saying, if you got one, if you like blessing someone, I like to be blessed. But you, some people here, you were around back in the 70s when I was born in the early 70s. And because uh, I, I turned 50 this year. Um, I know you don't, I don't look like I could turn 50, but, yeah, no, nobody's buying that, are they? <laughs> so I was born in the 70s. About the, about the time I was born, there's this whole thing that went on in the U.S. Um, with President Nixon administration where they tried to break into the Democrats' um, offices in this hotel called Watergate Hotel. And so, and that birthed every other gate from then on, you know, they all started with the Watergate Hotel, right? And what happened there? And so some guys who were working on behalf of the Nixon administration um, got caught trying to do that. And they didn't, you know, I don't, who knows why they did it. They were going to win the election anyway, but they decided it was a good idea. And so what happened was Chuck Colson, the founder of Prison Fellowship, he was a guy who was the chief White House counsel at the time of the break-in, and then he subsequently left the White House to go into private practice. But then as this was all coming out through the Senate inquiries and you know, um, going through before the courts and all that sort of stuff, he got dragged into all this as somebody who was part of the administration at the time. They didn't really have anything on him, but they were going to try and prosecute him and tar him with the same brush as everybody else who was more directly involved. You know, there's a series starring Julia Roberts and Sean Penn that was on um, Stan recently, or it's probably still on Stan because once it's on there, it pretty much stays on there um, for a while at least. And so anyway, this whole thing happened around about 50 years ago. And, uh, but Chuck wasn't, Chuck wasn't a Christian guy at all. Like Chuck was a bit of a head kicker, really. He was an ex-Marine who became uh, a lawyer who uh, became this White House counsel and he was known as um, Nixon's attack dog. And so he would go hard after the, the opposition, anybody who was opposed to Nixon, and really try and, you know, bring them down and make sure that they, they weren't uh, anybody that anybody wanted to listen to. So he was a hard nut and he wasn't a Christian guy. But then when he left the White House, he, 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 was, he was working with a... a, a um, uh, you know, working with different corporate clients. And one of his corporate clients, one of his biggest corporate clients was a Christian guy. And he began to share his faith with Chuck. And in that moment, uh, uh, Chuck felt something different. I knew there was something different about this guy and felt drawn to it. And so in that place, he made a decision to follow Jesus. And then all this stuff began to really blow up with the media and, and all that sort of stuff in Washington. And so Chuck is in that place. And he's being accused of all different types of stuff. And so that, that he's about to be charged and he's going to, about to go before the court. And, but somehow the media gets to find out that he's a Christian. And so they're saying to him, hey, Chuck, you know, are you just becoming a Christian so that, you know, you could claim, oh, I found Jesus or whatever. And uh, now you can, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just pretend like nothing ever happened before. You're just doing it. And so they were very cynical about this. And Chuck had, uh, Chuck, Chuck had a whole bunch of Christian brothers around him. He began to pray with him. And Chuck began to get this conviction that I need to plead guilty. Even though they've got nothing on me, I need to plead guilty of obstruction of justice for a certain thing for the sake of my Christian witness so that the name of Jesus is not brought down low but that I can in good conscience say, you know, bring this out of the public eye and then, I, and then it, and it be done with. And so he pled guilty. The prosecutors weren't going to, well, they said later, we weren't going to charge him with anything because we didn't really have anything on him. Um, but he pled guilty to this thing. Sorry about that. More, more um, sanitizer. Sorry about that. Pled guilty to this thing. And now, and, and so that I can, I can get out of the public eye. So he pled guilty. He got a custodial sentence. He went to jail. In that moment, he would have been like, God, I did the right thing. A lot of other people just got a slap on the wrist. How come I'm the one who has to go to jail? 
Anyway, he did. In that moment, he began to, to look around him and have, begin to have compassion for the people who he was serving time with. That they needed Jesus. That they were in a, in a, a lot of them had come from dark backgrounds and never had a, any love or any of the love of God in their life before. But yet, and so began to have compassion for these guys. Then he served out his sentence. He got a, uh, you know, he got his sentence got commuted after about nine months, and he was released. And in, in that in that process. He started ministering in the prison while he was in the prison, praying with, his, with different guys and started ministering to other prisoners. But then when he got out, he was thinking, what should I do? Should I, you know, I could go into corporate world or whatever. But he felt like, no, I'm going to start a ministry to prisoners. And so that was how Prison Fellowship started 40 years ago, over 40 years ago, 45 years ago, something like that, 46. Because one man decided that it was more fruitful not to choose freedom. Sometimes you have to choose between fruitful and freedom. And the consequences are great. You know, I think about um, my friend Jackie. Um, maybe the keyboard player lady, if you could come up. You know, here in Queensland. You know, I think of that ministry now, 40 odd years later. There's a lady that I know, her name's Jackie. And uh, she's, she come from a pretty good family, actually, Jackie. And she started doing law at UQ. She was pre-law at UQ. And uh, you know, she's a pretty smart woman. And so she was doing okay in her studies. But she, she met a guy and, um, you know, I don't know. I don't really know the details of the story. And, I've, you know, I, I don't like to ask stuff like that. But I do know that she left studying law married this guy, they had a son together, and they moved to PNG. And something happened while they are in PNG, and she, the relationship broke, broke up, broke down. The, the husband said to her, look, you know, I don't want you around anymore, you need to go back to Australia, and I'm going to keep the son with me. So Jackie comes back to Australia She's pretty distraught. You know, she's, her relationship is broken up. She doesn't have a means of support. And she's, she, hadn't, you know, she hadn't done any training or skills or anything like that. And she's, she's estranged from her son as well. He's in another country. So she ends up down at Goldie. And I don't know about you, but I don't reckon that, you know, you know that they used to say, what, what good can come out of, like, Nazareth? <laughs> what? Can anything good come out of the Goldie? Who knows? I don't know. But she ends up down the Goldie and she's, she's, she's pretty broken and she starts taking methamphetamine and she gets addicted to it and her life is kind of going on this downward spiral. And she, she hooks up with this guy who's like he's a pretty bad dude actually. Like he's a career criminal and He's well known to police all around Queensland, um, particularly on the Gold Coast where he operates. And he, he'd been in prison, in and out of prison a lot. Violent man, drug addicted himself. And she, she's with this guy and one day they're, they're out driving around the Goldie and, and they get stopped by the police and they've got, they've got drugs in the car. And a couple of unlicensed firearms. And so, you know, he turns to her and says, you need to tell them they're yours because I'm not going back inside. And he gave her the, the look like, if you, if you don't, there's going to be some serious consequences for you. Because that's the kind of man he was, just very self-centered. And so she pleads guilt. She, when the police come, she tells them that they're there, it's hers and, and uh, so they charge her and she gets um, sentenced to a custodial sentence. So she finds herself in prison and the, you know, she's still addicted to drugs and uh, she's in prison and you know, she's estranged from her husband and, and uh, it, her life is like at its lowest ebb. And this, this middle-aged lady starts coming into the prison She's actually a prison fellowship volunteer. Um, and she just comes in every week 
And she's something different about her, you know, like, who, who's this lady? All the, all the women in prison kind of recognise there's something different about her. And so Jackie starts hanging out with her and, and talking to her and saying, you know, we, we know that there's something different. You know, why do you come in to, to prison when you could be doing a whole bunch of other things, but you, you're here in prison now and, and you're here with us. Why do you come and do that? And so the lady began to share with her the love of Jesus, the message of the gospel. And so Jackie makes a decision to follow Jesus in prison. And so Jackie makes a decision to follow Jesus and, and uh, she uh, uh, says yes and then she gets off drugs and then she gets released from prison and so she comes out and, you know, her story is not just like this whole this thing. It's, it's a bit up and down, this story. And so she, she comes out and she finds herself falling back into some old patterns and she's back on drugs again. One night she's like, God, I don't want to be on drugs anymore. You got to help me. She wakes up the next morning. She doesn't have a craving for drugs. She goes through the day. She doesn't have a craving for drugs. She's never taken a drug since. God delivered her overnight. So then she's out, she's out and about. And uh, she's, you know, she's, she used to be on the go. So she's an exercise person. She's, she's doing all this stuff. And so she's running around South Brisbane and uh, she's, she's praying. She's saying to God, oh, look, I reckon I need to go to church. So she's, she's running around South Brisbane doing exercise. She sees the name of our church on the side of a building. She goes, I'm going to go there next Sunday. So she comes to church that Sunday and it's the start of the year. We're talking about Bible college. Like if you want to know more about Jesus, if you want to grow in your faith, you need to come to Bible college. So she's like, I want to do that. So she signs up for Bible college and she gets admitted to Bible college. Technically, she shouldn't be allowed to do Bible college because you need to have your blue card to, to serve because part of the Bible college is you serve in the life of a church. You got to have your blue card. My role, I was on staff at the church at the time. My role is, was to oversee these interns. They come to me and say, this lady needs to, to have somewhere to serve as an intern, but she doesn't have a blue card. I said, you guys should never have admitted her without her blue card. But I know it's God. They didn't do their job, which was naughty, but it was God. So she's in Bible college. We find somewhere for her to serve where, you know, she doesn't necessarily need to have a blue card, so there's no vulnerable people involved. And she's happy. She's doing all that. And so here's Jackie. <laughs> Nine months before, she was a hopeless drug addict in prison. Nine months later, fast forward, she's now clean. She's in a church family that loves her and she's doing Bible college. She's started to, re- to you know, she's, do- and it's incredible. But that's not where the story ends. She's, so then uh, somehow, you know, she's praying, God, I need to reconcile with my son because the son wanted nothing to do with her. He's ashamed of her. She's praying about that. One day the, the husband rings up. Uh, the son wants to connect with you. She's reconnected with her son. She gets joint custody of her son. So within, within the space of about 12 months, she went from being a, a drug-addicted prisoner with no hope in life to being somebody who's actually studying now to, for ministry to help other people to, to know Jesus and, and his love. Her family has been restored. Her relationship with her son has been restored. She's following Jesus. And it all started with a middle-aged lady who just wanted to do something. She wasn't a theologian. She wasn't a pastor. She wasn't somebody who was like, you know, a trained, like, uh, you know, health professional or anything like that. She was just somebody who loved Jesus who wanted to help somebody else. And her life was transformed. And that happens all the time in our ministry. So I want to thank you guys as a church for what you do. When you support us as Prison Fellowship, what you do makes a huge difference in so many people's lives. I just want to encourage you, like, you know, I've got to finish now, but, um, you know, after the service, I'm going to be down there at the, at the table there and uh, next to the lady in the high vis. And uh, um, I just encourage you, come grab one of these cards because um, we love people to pray for us. We need your prayer. This is frontline ministry, what we do. We need your prayer. We also love for people to pay for us too. And, uh, you know, if you, you know, so you can, you can fill in the details there and, and, uh, and uh, make a uh, 
commitment. If you make a, like a, a consistent commitment, I'll even throw in today a free book for you as well. But we'd love for people to come and play with us as well, play for us, make a difference in people's lives. Um, and, uh, you know, you could come and talk to me about how you could do that. You've got Woodford Prison just up the road here and, and uh, we'll just up the road around the corner all the way to California. And uh, it's, a little, it's a little ways up the road. But you're reasonably close. And uh, we'd love for people to come in and volunteer with us and make a difference in people's lives. And uh, we'd be, be such a blessing to us. Just...